welcome everyone to this LCA Unlocking Nature webinar about how Botswana predator conservation is using chemical signals from large predators to protect both predators and livestock. Why do we need to protect large predators? And that's because lethal control over their killing of livestock is the main threat to their populations. And that's true all over the world. At the same time, predation on livestock is a direct threat to rural livelihoods, particularly for the poorest and, and smallest livestock holders. From both of those points of view, stopping predators from killing livestock is a win-win. The second aspect of the why question is why do we want to use repellents and bioboundaries based on chemical signals when there are already other measures in place? The answer to that is actually fairly simple. If the measures that are already in place were effective enough, then we wouldn't have these other reasons to be using a different method. There are two main legs to the overall bioboundary project. The one is focusing on African wild dogs, and the other one is on predators which are already living out in the livestock areas. I'll talk first here about the African wild dog bioboundary proper, which is aimed to keep African wild dogs inside the safety of protected wildlife areas. The uh, African wild dog has been classified as endangered. The total population is somewhere between 3,000 and 5,000 individuals, but because they are obligately social, they always have to live in packs in order to breed. That represents only about 700 breeding pairs in the whole of Africa. Uh, they are naturally living at very low densities um, around one adult per 60 to 100 square kilometers and quite often even fewer than that. And a consequence of that is that few populations are big enough or live in areas that are large enough for the wild dogs to sustain themselves. So Lou Game Reserve in Tanzania is one of them, potentially the Kruger Park, and for certain Botswana and the larger Kaza area going up into Angola, Namibia, southern Zambia and Zimbabwe uh, is the main stronghold. There is for sure a self-sustaining wild dog population in that area and that is the one that I'm working on. Throughout the whole of the wild dogs range, humans are their main cause of death. Uh, dogs that leave protected areas are particularly vulnerable. They are <clears throat> the least popular of all the predators among livestock farmers. Only about 5% of the total wild dog population are actually fenced away from livestock. And all of those that are fenced away from livestock live in South Africa, part of the meta population there. Electric fences like this are effective at containing wild dogs, but they are way too expensive to be employed on continental scale, and they need way too much technology to be viable throughout much of Africa. Nearly all of the wild dogs, 95% of the population, live in open systems where the only thing between them and the livestock which gets them into trouble when they kill them is fences like this, if there's a fence at all, which get knocked down by elephants. And if the elephants leave them standing, then things like war dogs and aardvarks dig underneath. And wild dogs are perfectly capable of penetrating any of these, these um, quite nominal fence lines. Uh, the bioboundary concept is based on using the chemicals in body odors, secretions, and scent marks that mammals use to communicate. It is completely universal among mammals that we all use smells to communicate with one another. Carnivores in particular mark their home ranges with scent, either urine, feces, various glandular secretions. And our aim is to use artificial equivalents of those home range demarcations to send the same keypad messages as the natural ones do and by 
sending keep out messages to keep predators away from livestock so they don't end up like this poison wild dog did being killed by livestock owners in order to protect the livestock owners livelihoods in order to make bio boundaries these artificial home range markers we have to be able to live create long-lived artificial marks in order to create artificial territorial boundaries and that means that we need to know what chemicals in the wild dog territorial scent marks actually send the keep out signal so all we need to do is make artificial scent marks how difficult can that be well <clears throat> the process for a start is reasonably complex and there's multiple rather challenging steps to it it is absolutely essential to start off with an understanding of the biology of the scent market because if we don't understand that we cannot interpret the results of any of the other steps so having understood the biology of scent marking we would then collect some scent mark samples subject them to various chemical analyses so that we know what they are composed of integrate the data from the chemical analysis with fieldwork results from biology that will tell us which of the components of the scents are candidates to be produced by synthetic chemistry incorporated into artificial scent marks and then tested biologically back in the field and this cycle can be repeated as many times as, as are necessary now <clears throat> There are some quite substantial challenges, of course, in this. Otherwise, we would have done it already. Insect pheromones are very well understood. Now, the next step up in challenge is laboratory mammals. And there's been considerable work done on laboratory mammals. So we can now say that we have an un a genuine understanding of what underpins their chemical communication. The laboratory, of course, is only a tiny, tiny microcosm of what goes on in the wild. For a start, you can keep mice in cages, whereas things like wild dogs range over tens of kilometers a day and over home ranges of up to a thousand square kilometers. Their social structures are way more complex. Uh, they are, of course, never there when you want them. And there is no prospect whatsoever of doing any experimental manipulations on them which was absolutely essential to the understanding that has been built up around laboratory animal chemical communication. So these are the biological challenges that we take on when we say, okay, we're going to make an African wild dog bioboundary. There are also very substantial analytical challenges, and these apply to all mammal odors, both in the lab and those that are wild. And the main one is that mammal odors themselves are hideously complex there are quite literally thousands of different compounds in mammal urine in mammal feces in mammal anal gland secretion so what to do under these circumstances of biological challenges and analytical challenges well the current orthodoxy is actually to give up with working on chemical communication in wild mammals nearly all the work is done on laboratory species and what is done on wild vertebrates these days is mostly done on reptiles and birds now of course we don't have this option we absolutely have to come up with some way of keeping wild dogs safely inside protected areas and at the moment bio boundaries look like the best option so we have to solve the problem and the two strategies that we're following to solve the problem is one called reverse engineering and the other one is a response guided or message guided strategy reverse engineering says if we were to design a chemical signal that would work under african conditions in habitats where wild dogs live what would it have to look like it would have to survive air temperatures of 40 degrees centigrade ground surface temperatures 70 degrees centigrade it would have to be able to send its messages with a range of relative humidities of 40 to 70 percent temperatures all the way down to minus six and things like rain 
and seasonality are also going to affect the design of a chemical signal. Now, this approach allows us to eliminate a long list of potential compounds from the even longer list that we've got of things that are in the scent marks. But it doesn't allow us to eliminate anywhere near enough to get down to a sensible short list. This eliminates a whole lot more. Uh, any message which is being sent to a conspecific, an animal of the same species, has to stand out from the chemical background. There are huge quantities, kilograms per hectare, of volatiles given off by vegetation. Every other species in the habitat is putting its own scent marks out. And the wild dog scent mark has to have something about it which stands out to other wild dogs. That then by analyzing lion feces and lion urine, various antelope secretions and odors, um, elephants are very very abundant where we are and produce huge quantities of urine and feces so we've analyzed those as well and we can assume on reasonably good evidence that anything which is very abundant in these other scent marks is probably not going to be sending messages between wild dogs because any messages that they tried to send would be swamped by all the other compounds that are there. So the complement to reverse engineering is to ask questions about what is present or much more abundant at least in materials that send signals versus those that do not. And also, which is another way of asking the same question, what is present or more abundant in materials that the target species respond to and those that they do not. But of course, this supposes that we know which materials carry the signals and how the animals respond to them. And this is where we're trying to work out with how the animals respond to the signals and which materials carry those signals. This is the Okavanga Delta, Northern Botswana, <coughs> Mound, the <coughs> gateway to the four and five star, two to five thousand dollar a night lodges, which are scattered throughout this area. And here is our study area on the eastern side. We're about in the eastern half of Maremi, up to Kwai, down to Shirobi, and a bit further east across the gravel road that ends up in Chobi. Uh, at the moment, we've got eight collared packs, um, which we're keeping tabs on using GPS and radio tracking and um, some other satellite packs that our study packs interact with. A quick uh, look at the timeline will give you a little bit of context. Back in 1996, um, Tico McNutt had the bioboundary idea spring on him when um, core packs were wiped out by rabies and it took several months for their neighbors to move into their vacated home ranges. And that gave Tico the idea that perhaps there were very long lived scent marks hanging around in the environment, which made the neighbors think that the residents were still there. Uh, between 1999 and 2004, Megan Parker, a PhD student was in the field and she was specifically researching the responses of PACs to each other's scent marks. And she wrote that up as a PhD thesis that was actually published in 2009. Now, meanwhile, Tico and I have been raising funds from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. And that overlapped with Megan's findings coming out. In 2008, I moved up to Botswana to set up the Bioboundary Laboratory. Um, and we started with the field work and analytical work in parallel. In 2015, the mass spectrometer, which is the, is the guts and brains of the whole laboratory, was killed by a power surge, um, which pretty well put an end to laboratory operations. But very fortunately, in the same year, 
there was a very significant discovery made in the field that African wild dogs use shared scent marking sites, which I'll talk more about in a moment. In 2019, the St. Louis Zoo Wild Care Institute stepped up with very significant funding, which allowed us to ramp up the field work, specifically looking at the use of marking sites. And in 2021, um, in June 2021, a new mass spec was delivered with funding from the Wild Ice Foundation. So we are now pretty much back on track. Very, very brief summary. We collect urine, feces and scent marks in the field from known dogs. They're recognizable from coat patterns. Obviously, we know the date and we know the location. If we immobilize dogs for radio collaring, then I collect uh, prepucial gland secretions and anal gland secretions as well. And those are analyzed by gas chromatography mass spectrometry in the bioboundary laboratory, which is in MAU. Now, a very, very brief summary of the early findings of the project. One thing that stuck out very, very clearly was the extreme variability in chemical composition between different, what we assumed at the time were scent marks. What we're seeing here is a 1,000 to 10,000 times difference in composition, concentration, and very obviously a huge difference in complexity between these two samples, the one shown in green and the one shown in red. This would not be expected if both of these materials are sending chemical signals. If they were sending significant chemical signals, the expectation would be that they would be similar and they are very clearly very different. At a finer level, if we compared from day to day, the difference in composition in samples of the same material taken from the same dog. So this is urine from a subdominant female, as an example, taken on consecutive days. So this is 20th February, this was 21st of February. And you can see here, we have two compounds in the red trace, which are nearly absent here. We have one in the green trace of which there is no sign here. Down here, there are some similarities, which we'd expect. Here, there are dramatic differences. And this definitely is not the pattern we would expect if both of these things are scent marks sending the same messages. That was a bit of a puzzle. Another huge puzzle was when we moved scent marks around. So we would, what we thought were scent marks, we would collect them from one pack, typically by finding the dogs with radio tracking and then waiting around until they urinated or defecated and then collecting the urine or, or feces and then presenting that to other packs. The results were completely erratic. Uh, we would sometimes get dramatic responses. Over 10 minutes of sniffing, multiple overmarking from the target pack and other times nothing. Um, juvenile urine was typically ignored, but if it was spiked with benzoic acid, then there would be quite intense sniffing. But benzoic acid on its own was either not detected or it was completely ignored. There was nothing consistent about any of this. It had nothing to do with location where the, where the scent mark was collected. It had nothing to do with location where the scent mark was presented to the experimental pack, there was a little bit of a sign that if you presented dogs with, with uh, the scent of dogs they would not usually have encountered. So in other words, not their neighbors, the dogs two, two home ranges over, they would respond more, but even that wasn't consistent. So this was a very, very serious puzzle. Because remember, we need to know which materials carry the signals and how the animals respond to them. In other words, we have to understand the biology of the scent marking in relation to ranging behavior if we're going to manipulate ranging behavior by using artificial scent marks. Now, the ranging behavior was quite well understood. We did a lot of very intensive radio tracking. 
Uh, we've got home range areas of up to a thousand kilometers. The dogs look as if they're moving erratically up to about 10 to 11 kilometers a day on average, but ex exceptional distances of 42 kilometers a day. Typically, they rest at a different place each day. They just bivouac under a shady tree. And in the strict sense, they're not territorial. But their home ranges do have stable locations. They don't just drift around all over the landscape. And packs do avoid one another. But the outcome of encounters doesn't depend on location, which is why, by the strict definition, we can't call them territorial. They don't have a long range contact call like lions and spotted hyenas do. They don't have any way of telling neighboring packs where they are without getting close to them. And so that leaves scent as by far the most likely candidate for how the packs are keeping tabs on each other's locations to the extent that they need to do in order to avoid direct encounters and not to trespass into each other's home ranges. We knew after some very intensive work by Neil Jordan and Jeff Gilfillan that scent marking within packs is related to status, but that wasn't necessarily related to communication between packs. Overall, the locations of where wild dogs urinate and defecate show no relationship at all to home range boundaries. And as I've already said, they don't respond predictably to feces and urine from other packs. So the puzzles just grow and grow. And we had really only isolated observations of encounters of packs that we were following with scent from other packs. Uh, you could count them on the fingers of one hand. So we didn't have enough information on encounters with other scent to interpret any of the other puzzling data we were getting. And it was fair and accurate to say that in September 2015, so this is with a dead mass spec and um, the lab actually not hardly operating, we did not actually understand the wild dog scent marking and ranging behavior. And with a project that was based around chemical analysis and understanding the relationship of wild dog scent marking and ranging behavior, this was a considerable conundrum as I'm sure you can appreciate. And then um, the exact date of 22nd October 2015, we had a breakthrough when one of our field researchers, Megan Klasser, saw a pack of wild dogs, one of our intensive study packs, sniffing, defecating and urinating. So in other words, potentially scent marking at the exact spot where a disperser group had sniffed and presumably scent marked, otherwise these dogs wouldn't be sniffing and marking over the top of it, little bit less than a month earlier. And this was potentially the key to unlock how it was that wild dog packs communicate with one another by scent. So what we're seeing here is a poker pack where the disperser group of females had urinated and defecated. And you'll see here the dominant male, Darius, sniffing very yeah. intently and urinating on top of something on the ground. So this is plainly a response to a scent mark. And this was a wow moment. We equipped the site uh, two days later with two camera traps and this little video just shows you the process <clears throat> and some of the results that we got very early on. This again is a poker pack and you can see what became quite typical behavior as we got collected more and more videos. We would come to expect intensive sniffing and also that the dominant pair in the pack would consistently countermark one another's urine and feces. This is a 
pretty well a signal of dominant status in these animals is the dominant pair will countermark uh, each other's scent marks. And over the first year, we built up a, a collection of several hundred videos that formed the basis for the growth of the of the camera trapping study of African wild dog behavior at shared scent marking sites, which prior to 2015, nobody had a single clue even existed, which is quite puzzling when you consider how many researcher decades have been thrown at wild dogs. So here we have Megan setting up a camera. There's a camera here watching a piece of dog poo at a shared marking site. We've got uh, 22 of these sites currently with equipped with camera traps and they cover somewhere between a half and a third of the fringe of the core packs home range. So we are estimating that there are between 50 and 60 of these sites all around their boundary and they are in the overlap between the neighbors and the core pack, which is exactly where you'd expect them to be if they were sending messages which were to do with organization, mutual organization of the use, use of space. Uh, early in 2021, we started increasing the spatial coverage at each of the marking sites to make sure that we weren't missing any scent marking events which were outside the field of view of the cameras that were there already. And we are now at 61 cameras out in the field, which is a very, very intensive monitoring study. And of course, it produces an absolute flood of videos. We're getting between 5,000 and 8,000 videos per week because the cameras don't trigger only on wild dogs. They trigger on every single animal that walks past. And very often they trigger on grass and, and bushes blowing in the wind. And we have these two wonderful ladies based in the office in Mound who actually go through this tsunami of videos and sort out which ones have got animals in them and which among the animals are carnivores and which of those are wild dogs, uh, Onike Aladizzi and um, Shirley Puso. This is an example of the kind of video we get. Once again, a poker pack they feature heavily because they are a core study pack. You'll see <coughs> We have the dominant male coming in and you'll notice sniffing and scent marking on these white spots here. They are actually hyena feces and very often the wild dogs share their scent marking middens with hyenas. And you will have already seen this in those very first videos we got. The counter marking circling between the dominant pair in the pack. These are the same two individuals, Serenira and Darius, years and years later. Over here, which we didn't see very much in the first year, we have subdominance marking. In the first year, the poker was a little startup pack. They are now, when this video was taken, more than 30 strong. And so a lot of these subdominants are looking to disperse if they detect that there are suitable mates. So they are leaving their Tinder profiles at, um, at marking sites in order to advertise their potential availability as mates to any dispersers which move through the area. This is a different pack, different site, very similar behavior. And we see the same patterns of behavior at all of the marking sites. Intensive sniffing by multiple dogs, and then overmarking and countermarking of one another's marks. And this leaves no question at all that what they're doing here is actual scent marking. It is not just elimination of waste. They're not just pooing and peeing. They are leaving messages for other packs to come in to pick up and for dispersers to come in, come in and pick up. We also, of course, see dispersers leaving their Tinder profiles there for the, for the <coughs> potential dispersers in resident packs. Now, summarizing what we now know about scent marking sites, the dominance on nearly every visit that a pack makes to a scent marking site, the dominance scent mark there, 
and the dominance of the socially significant ones in the packs. Subordinates sent mark at marking sites if they're if there is dispersal in their future, typically within a year on the basis of data we've got um, uh, so far. The visits continue during the denning season. The dogs will actually commute from their den several kilometers out to the fringes of the home range and check for messages and leave their own messages there, even though their total home range that they use for hunting has contracted to about 25% of what it was before the denning season. So that says that these marking sites and the messages there are very significant to the dogs. They visit marking sites in the middle of the night at the dark of the moon when it is way too dark for hunting. So they are making, they are moving around in order to visit marking sites. They're not just dropping in on them while they're out hunting. The marking sites are at accessible locations, which is what you'd expect for something that multiple packs are going to have to find. They are in home range overlap zones, and typically they are at road junctions or other landmarks, so the dogs can remember where they are. And obviously, if they're shared multiple pack marking sites, they're used by multiple packs and repeatedly. So in other words, they fit all the criteria for places where sent messages are regularly exchanged between neighboring packs. A genuine eureka moment. This is how the packs are communicating with one another. Also, the marking sites are extremely long lived. This is a poker pack again. This is back at that original marking site, the first one we discovered. And it is in May 2021, so in other words, five and a half years after we first detected the use of the site, and it had obviously been in use before that, we have Serenira, the dominant female here, defecating, she just urinated. Darius had been killed by lions uh, in the February before this, this was in May this year. And you'll notice a distinct lack of sniffing among the other dogs, except where Serenira had urinated and defecated. That's because no other wild dog had used this site for 15 months before we got this video. So the dogs are definitely not finding these sites by olfactory search every time. They are remembering their locations and going back there to check on messages and to leave messages of their own. That's why they put them at landmarks, so that their, their locations are easy to remember. This particular site, which is right next to the main road to Maremi Southgate, we first collected scent marks here in uh, as far back as 2011. We've got records of GPS fixed scent mark samples collected here. 2011, four years before anybody at all knew that there was such a thing in the world as an African wild dog shared marking site and this site is still in use. And what is doubly interesting is that the pack that was using it when we first collected the scent marks died out long ago and the site was inherited by a poker and the neighbors to the north here and stayed in the same location. So this might explain why Wild dog home ranges tend from generation to generation, pack to pack, to be more or less in the same place in the, in the landscape. They are anchored by these inherited, very, very long lived marking sites. So these things are definitely extremely important in wild dog social organization. The marking sites actually make sense of all these extremely erratic results because not knowing that they existed, we'd collected the samples that we did these tests with from locations that with respect to wild dog scent marking were completely random. So most of them probably weren't scent marks at all. They were just poo and pee of no particular social relevance. It explains this extreme variability. If you're going to send a chemical message, you put chemicals in your poo and pee 
and you dump them at a site where you know other dogs are going to encounter them, a marking site. If you're just pooing and peeing, you don't need the messenger chemicals. Similarly here, <coughs> it's quite likely that when we thought we were looking at day-to-day -day differences, we were actually looking at place-to-place -place differences. That one or other of these is from a marking site and the other one isn't. Uh, we don't know which because this was a long time ago, 2009. We don't have historical records of where marking sites were in 2009 because like everybody else, we had no clue there was such a thing. But it would make sense of these otherwise extremely puzzling differences. It's not short term change, in short time changes in composition. It is differences in composition created voluntarily by the dogs depending on where they are. So these marking sites were the bit of the jigsaw that we needed to slot into place in order to get the project up and running again. Uh, this is where we got most of our samples from dogs that were sleeping because then they're easy to find, wait for them to urinate and defecate and then collect that material. We of course now know that most of it wasn't scent marks at all and that we should have been collecting our samples from marking sites, which is what we're now doing. So where do we go from here? We now have a handle on wild dog scent marking and ranging behavior. We have a nice new mass spec in the lab thanks to Wild Eyes Foundation. And so we're going to press the reset button. We're going to redo some of the translocation experiments, but from marking site to marking site so that we know the dogs will encounter the smell and we know that they will interpret whatever we put there in terms of scent marking behavior. We're going to redo the analyses on samples that we now know come from marking sites and we're particularly going to compare those samples with material not from sites because our suspicion is that only the material from the marking sites is actually sending anything like a keep out signal. So what is in marking site material and not in non-marking site material is our candidate substances for going into our artificial marks. And we will run the bioassays of the artificial marks instead of at random sites with dogs that are either wandering around or, or sleeping specifically at the marking sites so that whatever artificial marks we produce will be in a scent marking context. This is a very, very early result from one comparison between one dominant pair of one pack deposited at a resting site, which is the black trace here, and at the marking site, the green trace. And you can see that as predicted, there are compounds present in the material, the urine, at the marking site, which are not present or at much, much lower levels in the black trace from the resting site. And that's exactly what we hope for and exactly what we expect. These are the identities based on uh, mass spec library fits. And the ones that are in bold, I have already confirmed as being accurate in the analyses are done with the earlier material. So, and these are all, including the ones that haven't been confirmed, these are all available as pure compounds off the shelf commercially. So we're already in a position to start formulating artificial scent marks. At this stage, it would be jumping the gun slightly. I would like to do some more one-on-one -on -one comparisons with the same dogs um, between resting sites and marking sites. Um, but with the other samples I've analyzed, there is nothing so far to say that these compounds are not the critical ones for the artificial scent marks. So that was the African wild dog bioboundary. Uh, come back to me in about a year's time and we'll see how we're getting on. The other leg of the bioboundary project in the larger sense 
is to use repellents to keep predators away from livestock out in the pastoral and ranching areas. And the idea is to protect both predators and livestock. As I've already said, lethal control to protect livestock is the single biggest threat to carnival populations. Um, it's tied up with habitat loss, but habitat loss and lethal control always go hand in hand. And on the other hand, losses to predators are a major and very significant economic problem to livestock owners. This is typical practice in Botswana. We have vulnerable livestock uh, behind rather flimsy and not particularly predator-proof fences. And the consequence is that, <clears throat> excuse me, the consequence is that livestock gets killed. This calf was one of seven killed by a female leopard and a large male cub in a space of three nights. These are very significant losses, sometimes 20 to 30 percent of a livestock owner's total holdings. Nearly all the farmers only kill predators if the predators kill their livestock. And that means that if we can reduce the predator attacks, there will be much less lethal control of predators. And if there's much less lethal control, in Botswana, just little Botswana on its own, is a quarter of a million square kilometers of potential predator habitat outside its wildlife areas. Um, lions probably couldn't live there, but certainly all the other ones could as long as they stopped killing livestock. So how are we going to persuade them to do that? Well, one way is to use scent-based repellents, keep the the predators away from vulnerable livestock, such as kraaled calves. The great advantage of scent-based repellents, <clears throat> as opposed, say, to sounds and lights, is that once you've identified what components have to go in them, they are actually really low tech, and they can piggyback on the technology that's all been already been developed for insect pheromones. They are low cost, um, they don't need high purity chemicals and they don't need huge quantities of them. In fact, they need tiny quantities and they are low input. All the livestock owner needs to do is to hook something to a fence. Uh, there's no heavy labor involved. There's no large costs. So that makes them attractive to pastoralists. Um, they are easy to deploy. There's no skill involved and very, very little effort. Uh, even less than there is involved in killing predators, which is the main thing. We want something which is easier than hunting down predators and killing them. And very much we want something which is easier and cheaper than poisoning predators. Uh, maintenance is not an issue because they need no maintenance. The, the dispensers of the repellents are replaced. They're not repaired. And none of, them, none of them have any other possible use. They can't be repurposed. And unlike repellents, which are based on, on using predator odor to repel prey, they are based on the predator's innate responses to scent marks from their own species, which should make them quite resistant to habituation. Now, in order for them to demonstrate all these benefits, uh, scent-based repellents have to defy what has become an orthodoxy in the, in the study of mammal chemical communication, which is that mammal chemical signals are all extremely complex. So complex that it is practically impossible to create facsimile copies of them. And here you have a view of some of the complexity, but within this complexity in leopard urine, there is a single particular compound, which we identified, called 3-mecapto-3-methylbutanol, also called the Tomcat thiol because it occurs in Tomcat urine. It was available as a pure compound in a bottle off the shelf. And so we did some preliminary feasibility studies to see whether or not controlled release dispensers monitored with camera traps 
would be a way of studying free-ranging carnivores' responses to chemical components in their scent marks. And we had uh, six camera stations out for about three and a half months. And in that three and a half months, we expected more or less 20 leopards to go past on the basis of how many leopards other people had seen with camera trapping grids. In that three and a half months, we saw only one leopard, which was a puzzle. And that one leopard did this. As soon as it caught the scent from the dispenser, which is here, U-turn and went back to the and that has a in it, a single component of leopard urine. So the orthodoxy was already, the complexity orthodoxy was already looking shaky. We then thought this might well have practical application as an actual repellent to keep leopards away from livestock, and there might be other compounds in the smells of other predators that we can use similarly. So whenever there was a roadkill or a predator being immobilized for radio collaring or any other purpose, I would be in there. <clears throat> this is the glamour of, of wildlife research in there with my purple gloves, taking samples at the less interesting end of things. And these are just some examples of the results we got. <coughs> We've got a screening protocol whereby we dispense the candidate repellent from these little armored dispensers on both sides of a road. So no matter which way the wind blows, the scent is going to cross the road and we monitor with camera traps to see how the predators respond. Blackback jackal, and he is not liking the smell of that stuff at all. You can see by the way the grass is twitching, the wind is blowing across here. Blackback jackal does a U-turn. That's exactly what we want to see. These things are terrible predators of small stock. Honey badger. Honey badger don't give a shit. But honey badger gives a shit about what's in this dispenser. The wind is blowing like this. He catches the smell and he scuttles off. Honey badgers are hardly a major problem. Although if you've got chickens, they can cause terrible damage. But what it does is it challenges that complexity orthodoxy. There's a single chemical in there and the honey badger is responding to it as if it is a whole scent mark from one of its enemies. Similarly, African wildcat defying the orthodoxy by catching a scent. Once again, you see the grass blowing, crosswind is here. There's the dispenser. The cat catches the scent. up to the dispenser, cheek rub, which is a typical response to a scent mark, and overmark with urine. So that cat is responding to a single chemical as if it's a whole scent mark. And leopards, which are a definite threat to livestock, do a similar thing. The dispenser is over here. No way of telling which way the wind is blowing. But the leopard locates it, sniffs, urine sprays. So certainly the orthodoxy of complexity is looking very shaky, which is exactly what we want, because if these repellents are going to be economically viable, they have to be cheap and simple to make, and that means they can't be very complicated mixtures. So this in very brief summary, <coughs> is a look at which species are repelled by which chemicals and what was the source that we identified them from. And you don't need to worry about the details. But what is very, very valuable is that leopards, blackback jackals and spotted hyenas are all repelled at short range and more importantly, long range. So in other words, while those particular compounds were being dispensed, they didn't even come close enough to get videoed. These are very serious livestock predators, uh, most especially spotted hyenas and leopards. And if we can keep them away from livestock, it will enhance rural livelihoods and keep predators safe. These guys here are defying the orthodoxy as fast as they can go. 
and giving us hope that we can find more of these very simple single compound or simple mixture repellents among the other components that we haven't tested yet. We upscaled the leopard repellent to an actual demonstration product at a working kraal. We have calves behind a wire fence. On the fence, we hang the same kind of dispenser. This is a simple plumbing fitting, low cost, very robust. Inside that, there's a glass vial with a rubber septum through which the repellent disperses. This has been running now for nearly two years and leopards kill calves at this kraal only when the repellent has dissipated, which it did during COVID and when I couldn't order chemicals and for various other reasons. As long as the odor is being dispensed, the calves are safe. And this is a genuine working kraal. This is not some esoteric uh, academic research project. So what are the next steps with this? We want to scale up to more kraals, more compounds, more ranches. And as with the African wild dog bioboundary, um, I'll be back again to tell you more. If you want to keep up with progress, um, these are some of the sites that you can look at. This is my research gate profile. This is the Botswana Predator Conservation uh, web page. This is my Facebook page where I post quite a lot of the uh, videos that we catch from the camera traps. And this is the Wild and Trust YouTube channel where the, where the videos have a more permanent home. This, of course, has been a team effort over numerous years, which is why this list is so long and literally certainly too long to mention everybody. And so I'm not going to, but there the people are. I owe them a debt of gratitude. These are our major funders. The startup funding came from the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation back in the Botswana Predator Conservation Trust days. We've since been rebranded as Botswana Predator Conservation under the Wild in Trust umbrella. Um, Spectral Works and ResTech gave us um, material support in kind. Um, it's actually a very valuable way for supporters to leverage value. The Botswana Department of Wildlife and National Parks grants us the permits to, to work in the wildlife areas. St. Louis Zoo, who I've already um, mentioned, made very significant funding inputs to the field work. The Leopard S Foundation supports the field work on the repellent. And we yes. Yeah, thank you, Peter, for for the presentation. I think we've discussed this for several years back. But what I wanted to ask was the reproducing these uh, chemicals, these scent marks, and then placing them in the field. I, I want to believe that when you get the dogs or the predators, when they countermark, it's, it's a phys physiological reaction within the dogs, something ignites them, the biochemistry, to put up that particular chemical, right? That is my understanding. So when we reproduce it in the, in the, in the lab and place it in the field, how does it affect the innate response of the predator itself? I, I'm not sure if you, you get what I'm saying. Well, that's, that's one of the experiments we're going to do is what effect does it have on the animals? Uh, and what, what we're looking at specifically is we want only the part of the response which is to do with not trespassing into the neighbor's home range. There's obviously a whole lot going on there about reproduction and social status and dispersal, all kinds of very interesting stuff, which academics can work on for the next 50 years, as far as I'm concerned. I just want that to keep out signal. That's all I'm interested in. Mm. And that, that will be an experiment to try and try to keep the, um, keep the dogs inside the safety of the protected areas. What we specifically would be aiming at was uh, dogs that want to den 
either just inside or just outside the buffalo fences. We want to push those dens deeper into the protected areas That's when the dogs are really vulnerable. Mm. Thanks, Peter. I was wondering myself what effect this would have. Uh, Kotla, please, you can go ahead. Yes. Uh, yes. Looking at the, the extent of the human wildlife conflict, uh, particularly in the area we are working in, and then Gamilan district, we've got different predator guilds there. So if we are so replicating these particular set marks as well, would it be targeted? I saw one particular slide that you shared on the last part of your presentation, one of the last slides. You shared, you shared active compounds within each different, uh, different uh, compound, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, well, these, the, the expectation is that most of these signals would be species specific. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be a bit of overlap. There's uh, some other really fascinating stuff we come up with that, that predators tend to overmark each other's scent marks. But our expectation is that these would be species specific. So if somebody had a problem with wild dogs, we would use the wild dog repellent. If somebody had a problem with a leopard, they'd use leopard repellent. But most likely we could formulate some kind of general predator repellent that would keep the especially spotted hyenas and leopards. If we can keep those away from the cattle and keep caracal and jackals away from sheep and goats, that's going to solve 90% of the problem. Oh, so you're working towards a general one that will work for different well, if, if there's a, If there's a need for a general one, then yes, we would definitely aim to develop develop it. Because what, what we're doing here is being guided by the needs of the farmers. The main yes. idea is to protect the farmers' livelihoods so that the farmers don't need to kill predators. And if they don't need to kill them, then they won't. They don't do it just out of spite. Um, so the, the requirements of the farmers will guide our final production. Thanks, uh, thanks, Hotla. Are you? Yes. Are you, yes. You if just if I could just make a, a follow up, please. What is the anticipated lifespan of these uh, scent marks that you manufacture the lab? That will depend on uh, exactly how they're formulated and also on the controlled release technology that we use. The, the Tomcat thiol that we use as a repellent at that crawl, if we put 100 milligrams into a slow release dispenser, it lasts about three months. Okay. All right. Um, okay. But that's, that, that's really a, it, it is a technical aspect of the delivery, which we can tailor, once again, we can tailor it to requirement. The suspicion is that if you just put the stuff out there and leave it, uh, just set and forget, that sooner or later the animals will habituate to it. So the, you, it, would need, it would need clever application. So if you've got, say, vulnerable calves in a crawl, you would put the repellent there. When the calves get big enough to be going out with the mothers, you take the repellent away. Uh, quite possibly also, once we've identified more potential repellents, you would swap from one to the other. Let's say monthly intervals or whatever, or you'd swap between um, chemical repellents to lights and sirens so that the animals never get a chance to get used to anything. Thanks, Hotla. Thanks, Peter. Over to Martin Strauss and thereafter Richard Masabedi. Martin, please just unmute yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, very interesting. Very talk. Um, I was wondering if you were aware of the work done by Kim Valenta from the University of Florida. Um, she's done something similar using sensory lions uh, to try and repel. Um, so far, only, 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 used, only uh, elephants. elephants. Um, but I was wondering. Uh, the issue usually with um, using repellents is that sooner or later the animals get used to it. 
Um, now one would hope. Now one would hope. Medical signals that they won't. But um, have you picked up anything like that, or do you, or have your trials not run long enough? Run long enough. Uh, well, um, nearly all the repellent work. In fact, it might be true to say all of it is using the smell of one species to repel another, including elephants and lions and lions and wild dogs and lions and the neighbor's dog that's shitting on your lawn, et cetera, et cetera. It's all interspecific. And typically, it's predator prey. And uh, the prey animals are very good at working out that no, actually, there aren't any predators around. But what we're doing is we are using intraspecific chemical signals. Now, if the animals habituate to them, they will get dishabituated when they next encounter a genuine chemical signal, which has got that same compound in it. They can never afford to completely ignore it. So when we're using leopard scent on leopards, a component of jackal scent works on jackals. It's also a component of um, honey badger scent, most likely, because it's quite widespread. And as you saw from the video, it works on honey badgers. So this is intraspecific. We're using a component of the species' own odor as a repellent, not an odor from a different species. And that's why we're hoping that if there is habituation, it will take a lot longer and be a lot easier to manage. Uh, thanks, Peter. I just want to check two things, please. Peter, do you have a second computer on? Because we get quite a bit. Uh, there's a. Uh, all right. Is it, um, is, it, is it an echo? Yeah, there's an echo there's coming an echo through. Coming. Hmm. I don't know. It might, might be somebody else with a. Um, who's who's uh, unmuted and then their okay. microphone is picking up the sound from their computer all right let's I'm, hope i'm operating on one instrument yeah thanks can i just ask that everybody ensure that they are muted um uh, peter i'm i'm not sure if martin was uh, um uh, done with these questions uh, yeah. martin just raise your hand or come in if you want to I'm happy, thank you. Well, great. Whatever we did, it sounds loud and clear now. Uh, Richard, then Marty. Richard, please. Yeah, thank you for, for this uh, opportunity. Uh, mine is mainly a, comp a compliment. Um, thank you very much, Peter, for the, the wonderful work that you are doing. And I was just wondering, because in your presentation you indicated that at some point you you stopped because the microspec was not working how closely are you working with okavango research institute because they are in maung as well so do you do they know about yeah. you do, do you get in touch and, and work together sometimes uh, they don't have a mass spectrometer that works. They've, they've got one that's been in a box for a very large number of years. They, they don't have the lab, lab instruments that I need to do this work. Okay. All right. No, I'm just happy about this because um, the Botswana Defense Force once approached us here at, at Botswana International University of Science and Technology to come up with ideas of, um, you know, using natural compounds, natural repellents for, you know, a range of different organisms, snakes and, and, um, and other things. So I think, you know, you, 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 you obviously have a lot of experience that we can gain from getting in touch with you. Thank yes, you. for sure. I'm, I'm always looking for local expertise. Um, and uh, at one stage, uh, do you know Lesecho Mwamalef? Yes. He used to work in my lab. He used to work in my lab. 
Right. Um, so that, that gives me a contact in the South. One of the practical problems we've got is that, of course, you're almost in a different country down there. And we have to get, we have to get foot and mouth permits just to send samples. So it's, uh, that was one of the motivations for putting the lab in mound because then there's less paperwork. Uh, it really is difficult, but it might be easier working from your end. Yeah. I think Thank you, uh, Richard. But yes, for sure. Let's let's keep in contact afterwards because um, uh, it seems there's hardly even one species of wildlife that doesn't cause a problem for somebody, and snakes are prominent among them, of course. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Peter. Um, Marty, Peter, if you haven't met Marty, you're going to meet him now. <laughs> How's it, Peter? Thanks for a very very interesting talk. Um, I, yeah, two, one, one's uh, just an observation or quite an interesting thing. There were uh, two wild dogs that actually um, came down into Mabula um, Game Reserve, which hadn't ever been there for the, at least the last 30 plus years. And they managed to track it that they came all the way from Thule. So it's, it's actually quite incredible how far these animals are moving, 350 kilometers and, and that sort of thing. So... Yeah, it would be interesting to know whether the scent marking and whatever could uh, protect all of those um, livestock areas that they would have moved through between between the areas. Um, <clears throat> I was just wondering, um, ha have they uh, look, explored anything with um, rock hyraxes, dussies? Um, because they're a huge problem, I think, in domestic houses and whatever. Do you think um, the same sort of scent? Now, as far as I know, there's been no work at all on dusty scent marking. Okay, so, um, I mean, do you think it could work going um, dussies and that uh, is with the chart with mine? Well, it might do, but somebody would first need to look at what the role of scent marking is in, in dussy social behavior. Otherwise, it's just guessing. I mean, they make these huge mittens, as I'm sure you were aware. Um, massive layers of, of feces and urine and last accumulate over hundreds of years apparently. Um, but what the role of that is in, in dusty social behavior, as far as I know, nobody knows. Okay, no, thanks very much. I know there are a massive uh, problem in certain areas um, <clears throat> where they you know, almost take over and they're getting feeling improved and things and might be a solution, but thanks for the Thanks for the answer. Okay. I think uh, the Dussie question uh, is an interesting one because it, it certainly comes from a lot of farmers in the Karoo and it comes from homeowners in Cape Town and Johannesburg that are having dusty problems. And if they'd had scent marking repellents to keep the leopards out of the domestic areas and keep the Dussies in control, they probably wouldn't have had a problem. So it's... it's, it's uh, it's the next step, the predators have all gone. So that's where the dusties have become the problem. Uh, second observation, Pete, I just want to tell you in a couple of, and maybe a month's time, we're having a, a talk on the Chinko Reserve here in Central Africa. And uh, I was talking to uh, Terry Abasha the other day um, about the, his talk and um, uh, they have got so far known over 120 wild dogs in their reserve. It's, a, it's a, definitely a stronghold for, for wild dogs, uh, um, so uh, and that's that's what they they can see, you know, they've seen. But um, it's in a vast area, and the population will probably keep growing. But yeah, just uh, don't forget Central African Republic when you mention where wild dog strongholds are. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, it's the feature of wild dogs that they tend to pop up in areas where people didn't even know they existed. Um, there's, there isn't there a population up in Ethiopia as well or somewhere? Suddenly they've, and that's partly to do with this very long range dispersal they do. They can get in there and, and as long as there's no active persecution and not too many lions is the other issue. Um, then they can very rapidly breed up into a sensible sized population. Um, so they are they're a remarkably resilient species as long as we can get the persecution down to a a sensible level. Uh, I think wild dogs will actually do fairly well. Peter, it was an amazing talk you gave. Really, really fascinating. I have so 
many questions uh, in my head now that, that I'd like to ask, but I'll focus on just one, the, the, just the most important one for now. <clears throat> um, so Peter, in the, the latter part of your presentation, you showed us the table where um, you, 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 you showed which, which scent uh, compounds are responsible for repelling what animals at either a, a close range or a long range. Um, at, at, at which range they 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 were effective, close or, or uh, yeah, close or or long range. So my question, Peter, is um, uh, could you perhaps like elaborate a little bit on the mechanics of how the the scents are dispersed, how 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 they either are just concentrated in a sort of localized area or spread further out? Because I mean, when one thinks about it, uh, of when one thinks about what could disperse a scent to, to make it uh, detectable by a given predator at a longer range, for example, you'd think that uh, the, the, the wind, like a little breeze or something would, would pick up the, the volatiles or whatever and send it along or the compounds and send it along. But then you have other factors, as you mentioned, you, you have, it might not be just a, a day with a little bit of a breeze, but there might be a lot of sun or it might be the, the opposite case. It might be cloudy and there's a lot of condensation in the air and that adds other things to what would normally just be the the isolated um, uh, compound or, or scent itself. So, could you maybe just elaborate on on like how how the the scents are are like uh, constricted to either a, a, a close range detection or longer range detection? Yes, scent moves with the wind and goes basically downwind. But the way that air moves at uh, distances of 10 to 50 meters, say, is actually quite complex. Uh, you get little eddies and swirls and it moves up and down and all kinds of things. And you also get, um, once you get into the scale that the meteorologists call micro, so it's several hundreds of meters, you get some very complex air movements. Now, the animals, of course, have got some built-in ability to decipher all of that because they depend on responding appropriately to scent marks to live their daily lives. So that's one of the reasons why we're <clears throat> specific, specifically using components of scent marks so we can tap into that ability of the animals. Now, um, short range in that table means that we had video on the camera trap of the animal being repelled, like those I showed you. Long range means that the number of videos of that species that we captured dropped to zero while we were dispensing that particular odor. So we've obviously got no video of that because the animals weren't near the camera traps. All we see is that we don't see them. And that could be over a range of anything from 10 meters to 100 meters or a kilometer. There'd be no way of telling the difference with the screening setup that we've got. Um, interestingly enough, with jackals, uh, they disappeared halfway through the dispensing session with scattle, and they didn't come back for three and a half months. Uh, now, whether or not that was due to the odor or only the odor or there was something else going on at the same time, we don't know. That's one of the reasons why we need to scale this thing up and roll it out to different areas. So we've got controls built into the thing to see if the results are consistent. So yeah, long, long range and short range and the, the complications of how scent moves with the air is a thing that there needs to be much more work on. There's been a lot of work done on insect pheromones and there's been a lot of work done on long range dispersal of um, pollutants and odors, particularly from livestock farming in the States. It's a huge problem. But there they're looking at kilometer scale, or certainly several hundred meters, which is a larger scale than the animals are responding to the repellents. 
So there's a whole field there for somebody who wants to get into nanometeorology, um, small scale air movements and how they, how they carry scent around. But certainly you know, in the, the average domestic dog, um, Rock Brummer will, will be able to, to wax eloquent about this. You get a half decent sniffer dog and the complexity of the behavior that it exhibits while it's working up to a scent target is quite astonishing. And that, that is built into the animal's brains and it is a thing which we can use in order to make the repellents more effective. I was wondering, um, I work, I'm in the States in Oregon and, and there's a common practice that the ranchers will use uh, guardian livestock dogs to protect goats and sheep. And um, I think I saw an article that the guardian livestock dog on their perimeter around the fence or around the herd is um, marking territory and that it has been successful on predators. And in regards to the bigger predators like grizzly bears and wolves, they use um, a human on horseback also in that herd. And they just um, live for three months with the herd, kind of like old times, <laughs> how it used to be. Anyway, um, back to you. Yes, I think, I, I think I've seen the same paper about whether or not uh, livestock guarding dog urine is a territorial signal for coyotes, was it? I think there's been similar work done on jackals, and, and it's not all that clear cut as far as I remember. Um, now in Botswana, Cheetah Conservation Botswana has done some very good work using local breeds of dog, which aren't really, these are the kind of African village dogs, scruffy little mutts mostly but they make very good livestock guardian dogs. And there is in fact in Botswana, a long tradition of that. Uh, it was the, it always has been the role of the village dogs to look after the livestock. And they are very effective against things of caracal and jackal size. The dogs themselves aren't very big. Big dogs don't do well here because it's too hot and they eat too much. Um, but yeah, there was, there was some interest locally also on, testing whether or not ordinary dog urine would be a jackal repellent. And it might well be. It's a thing that would be worth looking at. The problem is, of course, then you have to collect the dog urine. Uh, and it's often more practical if you can work with synthetics, then you can have a nice uniform formulation that you know works, which can be tailored to different conditions and you can have a slow release technology which is tailored to that particular formulation. Whereas if you're working with dog pee, um, first you've got to stand with a jam jar behind the dog at the appropriate moment. Um, so now if, if the livestock guarding dogs could be induced to pee in the appropriate places, maybe that would help. But certainly most, most livestock kraals have got some dogs running around and their main effect is to make noise and just add that little bit extra to the landscape of fear for the, for the pest predators. Um, it would be an interesting thing to look at the urine. I'd be astonished if jackal urine and um, dog urine wasn't remarkably similar chemically. Um, probably almost identical. And so that might, that might give some leads to what would be useful for a synthetic formulation. So I, I know Peter mentioned this in his talk, but my feet dropped out when he was talking about it. That variation in chemical composition of the samples that you saw over time and space was intriguing. And I, I didn't catch quite how you explained that variation that you saw. Maybe you could just very briefly, if you don't mind. Well, the, sus the suspicion is, and remember when we collected those samples, this is before anybody knew there was such a thing as a African wild dog shared marking site. This was a completely new discovery. So we were collecting material effectively at random. So in other words, without reference to whether or not it was actually a scent mark, it was urine and feces, but whether it was sending chemical messages and especially chemical messages to neighboring packs, we have no idea. And what was striking was the extreme variability which would be explained if some of what we collected wasn't actually a scent mark. It was just pee and poo. And others that we collected was actually a scent mark. 
that was P and Q plus whatever they add with the glands along the tracts. Place to place, well, in fact, day to day. We thought it was day to day. We'd collect from a dog on one day, same dog on a different day, huge differences, which was a puzzle. But we were collecting from different places as well because the dogs go to different places at different times. So what we thought was day-to-day -day variation was equally plausibly place-to-place -place variation. But because we didn't realize that in the dog's head there were such dramatically different places, the scent mark sites are really concentrated. We're talking something typically from 20 to 30 meters across in a home range, which is 10 to 15 kilometers across. They are tiny little dots on the wild dog's maps, but it's where everything happens. So what we thought was day-to-day -day variation is equally plausibly place-to-place -place variation, which, we were, which is what I'm looking at again now. And certainly in the one head comparison that I've got, there is very similar, very clear quantitative and qualitative differences which we now assign place to place because we know now how important place is to the dogs. Peter, I know that this is all very new stuff, um, but I've just got a couple of things in my mind that I wanted to ask you. And it's, it's just basically focused around the biochemical structures. I suppose, as I said, it's all fairly new. Uh, the first thing is, could you maybe just send me um, the, the st an indication of the structures, two-dimensional, if it's possible, of all of those of all of those uh, chemicals, those biochemicals, just to have a look at it. But what I'd like to ask you is, is there not a common thread amongst all of those biochemicals? For example, maybe a common a common ring structure within them? Because there's got to be some kind of commonality between these, these pheromones. Uh, I know insect pheromone studies are obviously very well uh, very well um, understood, but this is all quite new. Have you found any in the commonality between those structures? Uh, there's there's uh, carbon disulfide and carbon trisulfide and methyl. So, I mean, those are, they've got sulfur in. Tomcat thiol is also thiol, sulfur, sulfur with a hydrogen on it. Um, the aldehydes, they've got nothing in common with the sulfur compound. Okay. Um, and there is a bias because I'm choosing compounds which I can smell because then I can keep check of whether or not they're still being dispensed by the dispenser without having to do sophisticated calculations and guesswork about how hot it's going to be next week in the Heinefeld. Um, so I think it would be premature to say that there's commonalities in what acts as a repellent, because what you'll find is there's commonalities in what has got an odor. And that's anything with sulfur in it, as you will know. But plenty of odor, easy for humans to detect. Now, ultimately, what, what I should maybe mention here in this context is that humans, at the concentrations that the carnivores are being repelled by, can't smell anything. You can smell something right at the dispenser for the smellier compounds. As soon as you get two to three meters away, nothing at all, because obviously we don't want to repel people. There's no yeah. point having a carnival repellent at a crawl where the people can't go through their eye. Um, so yeah, I think at this stage, um, there is, um, I published a paper with Paul Weldon on, um, what do we call it? Search for design features in mammal pheromones, whether there are okay. any commonalities among what have been identified so far and which are genuine pheromones, right? We're, we're by no means certain what we're working on is anything to do with actual pheromones. But these are okay. the ones which have, okay. by, have been identified and we looked for the chemical commonalities and does it relate to function and speed or all the rest of the usual stuff? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Seems at yeah, the moment you, to be random. Yeah, uh, I'll I'll make sure you get that reference out, or have no, a look on my you. on my research great, case profile. It's on there. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Weldon, and um, 
yeah, it's what mammal pheromones, no, vert, what is it? Vertebrate pheromones search for design features. Okay, great. Uh, and it's got, I mean, it's a long, it's a long and very dense, <laughs> very, very dense chemical paper. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that will answer your question. Yeah, I, sp I suppose the sulfur is involved in, 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 in ensuring that there's great volatility. Well, yeah, maybe, but if you look at the mouse pheromones, for instance, um, the, whatever their names are, which escapes me at the moment, I've been talking too long, um, they are reasonably volatile but they depend for their long-term activity on being bound to specific proteins. And this has been the major advance with the, with the lab animals is the role of proteins, both as signaling molecules in their own right and as modulators of the release of the volatiles. Okay, great. Um, so molecular weight is, and this is in the paper, molecular weight of the volatile signals is actually not constrained because the scent marks have got slow release technologies built into them. Uh, 